Uh, all right, so let's get this thing started. Uh, first and foremost, we have uh, two excellent panelists here today to talk about what writers do beyond the page. Uh, to start with, we've got Gina Fattori. <laughs> and of course, Javier Grigio Marks Watch. I am horrifically white, and I'm sorry for that pronunciation, but did the best that I could. Um, thank you both for being here. Um, I'm very excited to, to have this conversation, and just so the audience knows, we will do like kind of an open Q&A at the end, so if you guys have questions, you know, think them over, make sure they're prepped and good, and actually questions. Um, but to start with, you two, when, when you were first coming up, like way back before you had your first professional job, and you were just kind of preparing to, to, to be a writer, um, and you got that job, like you, you got something that you felt like, okay, I'm in the industry now, I've got like a real thing to do. What were your expectations? Like as a writer coming into the industry, what did you expect <laughs> to do? Um. Well, is the next one what's the reality? Cause yeah. <laughs> it is, it will be, yeah. You know, you know what's I coming. Mean, okay, I'll take this first just because I have the weirdest story that I've told thousands of times and it helps no one because it is like a fairy tale. But um, after, I wanted to be a writer from the time I was 10. So, but you know, I grew up in Indiana where like the main kind of writing that I experienced was journalism. So I was always on that track. And uh, after I graduated from college, I interviewed at a bunch of, I was in New York, I interviewed at a bunch of magazines. Like I thought, you know, this is obviously a story from the 90s. Um, and uh, I really just thought, okay, I need to like just pay my rent. I just need a job. I need to get my foot in the door. And the job that I got was at the New York Public Library in um, the fundraising office. And I had this amazing boss who was the head of major gifts and planned giving. And um, I like to say now that Judy was really my first agent because her son was a television writer and his name is Greg Daniels. <laughs> he... <laughs> So like I, you know, I worked for Judy, I met Judy, I was doing my little newsletter back in the day and I was trying to be a writer and then really in this story five years go by in which like I have other jobs and I work on my newsletter and I move to Chicago and I get a job at the Chicago Reader, which is like an alt weekly that is still in existence. And uh, you know, I'm just still just trying to be a writer. I'm selling pieces to the different alt weeklies and, uh, and then one day Judy just calls up and she says, my son has a deal to create a show with the guy who created Beavis and Butthead, and I think you should move to LA and you should work for him and he should help you be a TV writer. So I had absolutely in my head the idea that I was going to become a TV writer. It was right there. And then, you know, I when I got there, I met people in LA, all these other assistants, and they were all like, you know, not every show like becomes a show. Sometimes it's just a pilot. And then King of the Hill became a show. Show. like approximately three months after I started working for Greg so um, and that was my first episode of television and uh, I was there at the beginning working for the showrunner seeing a show come to life that later lasted for 12 years so a very good story yeah I, I think that's good Javi how about you um like what was my the, what, what, what's, what, what was my expectation yeah yeah, yeah. okay so like Gina, I mean, I, I always wanted to be a writer. I, when I saw Star Wars at the age of seven in Puerto Rico, where I grew up, that's, I, I just looked up at the screen and said, I, know, I don't know what that was, but I want to do that for the rest of my life. <laughs> and, um, you know, so, so as, as somebody who came to the United States, um, everything, do you remember that? You, you don't remember it because you're from modern times. Um, there was a cartoon where Porky Pig goes to Hollywood. You know, and he's driving his little cartoon Porky Pig car onto the lot, and there's like people carrying giant props. You know, there's always people carrying giant props, right? So like, I always thought that first of all, giant props. You know, there's always somebody with a giant telephone or like a giant dog bone or something. You know, and like people carrying racks of costumes, and Edith Head is somewhere directing the, you know. And I thought it was going to be like that kind of like experience, like what they tell you you're going to have when you go on the Universal Studios tour. You know, and especially like as this, being so bright-eyed and being somebody who like. My dreams in life kept coming true, you know, like like my parents, I, I, I was not a very comfortable in Puerto Rico as a child, I think it's because I'm so pale. Um, so like, you know, we moved to a, to a cold place, which was really good for me because I'm so pale, and uh, and we moved to Michigan, and uh, and then I, I, I got to go to the same grad school as George Lucas and, and all this stuff, and like, and, you know, I thought, like I said, I thought it'd be all giant props. Um, I was rudely awakened <laughs> in my first job, you know, which was, um, 
working for a lot of the first jobs that I had were working for uh, men who had uh, come up in the 80s when television was essentially mad men with cocaine. Um, so, so, you know, like working with these guys and some of them were, were you know, at the peak of their assholery. Um, it, was, it was a really rude awakening because you realized, oh my God, like it's not just people carrying giant props and stuff. Like you meet some people whose work you've actually seen and admired and this is, what, and this is how they treat other people. So it was, it was a very big disconnect between, you know, the porky pig goes to Hollywood and, and what I actually experienced in my first few jobs, you know? <laughs> So I guess, you know, again, like because this is a panel that's kind of designed around what writers do beyond writing, do you have like any memories of like from those early jobs, something that was, you know, just surprising to you in terms of like, oh, this is expected of me. Like this is something that I, you know, I, I'm a writer. I, th I think of myself as a writer. I came here to write and they're asking me to do this thing instead, uh, you know, whether that's an actual you know, request that they had or just kind of a time requirement or uh, where you had to be or what you had to do, like anything like that stand out? I never thought I'd have to get so much cocaine for people. No, no, I didn't. No, no. Uh, no, my, no, Keep that my, off the record. We're not ready no, no. to talk about that yet. My first, my first gig, um, you know, like, like when my episode shot, um, the executive producer just says to me, well, go down to editing and do a cut. And I'm like, excuse me? <laughs> You know, yeah, go down to editing, talk to the editor, tell him what you want. Or whatever. And I'm like, well, I've never done a cut before. And he's like, well, talk to the editor. Tell him, you know, and, and I went down and this very nice editor who was, you know, working on the show sat me down and we talked over what it was to do a cut. And the one thing is, a really interesting thing about working with people from the 80s is that even though their personalities were very much defined by the era, uh, especially, um, you know, there's certain schools that came out of the 80s that were extraordinarily driven by, you're the writer, you go do it. You know, uh, you go produce your show, you go do the cut, you go do this, sink or swim, but you're gonna learn and you're basically in producer school here, so go. And uh, the experience of doing that and uh, being on these two 22 episode shows where like you were constantly in the grind of that was sort of like being in producer school and being in showrunner school. And that's something that in the last 10 years has been almost completely destroyed by the streaming culture. And that was just the grind of being in there. There's always work to do, and everybody has work that they need to be doing on the show, whether you're a writer or, or whatever. And the writers are involved with production from pre-production through production, through editing, through all of that. That was basically show running school. That's how you learn how to read a budget. You know? And, and that's, the, that, that's something that is just not there right now. Yeah, I'll second that a thousand percent. Um, I will say for me specifically, I did have, so my first job as a showrunner's assistant was in an animated show. So my first script was a King of the Hill episode. So I got to look at the storyboards for my King of the Hill episode. I still have them. Like that's something that only exists in animation, right? Then my first job as a staff writer was on a multi-cam sitcom, which is like putting on a play. So that's not just we wrote the script, that's we go to stage and we watch the run through. And then people, you know, figure out how to block it and they change the joke on tape night in front of the live audience. So the writers at that kind of television are involved in the whole thing. And then through a strange series of events, I wound up getting staffed on Dawson's Creek. And, you know, I did not necessarily set out to be a writer of teen drama, but I got that job and like I can still remember, I mean, we went to the set. Like I remember the first time I went to the set and uh, honestly, not a fan of the set. Like I was terrified. I'm like, we're outdoors. Like this is just <laughs> not... It's not working for me. Um, but uh, like, the, I remember I, I, so many moments, like the editor in the kitchen before I left, I, I was like, do you have any tips for me? And he was like, get coverage. I did not know what coverage was. Um, you, you took a sweater. <laughs> like, <laughs> I mean, it was, yeah, like, it's, I, so I always, I do say in meetings now, like Dawson's Creek was my film school because I had the same experience with the editing. Like my, one of the big episodes that I wrote like by myself was 20 minutes over. And so it was just like, you know, at that point we may or may not have actually, you know, we had a lot of chaos season three, which is documented in <laughs> my colleague, Jeffrey Stepakoff's book, which I'll put out a plug for. Um, but yeah, it was just go sit with the editor, take 20 minutes out of that. And all it just taught you. I mean, I was the person who had broken the story in the room. I was the person who wrote the multiple drafts, like to see it, to do that final writing of the story in the editing room is amazing. And, and it's not just that. I mean, you're also, you know, there are things that you don't imagine you're going to be opining on, but it, it forces, like, if you have, you have to go to a prop meeting, you know? Um, and so I, I, I created this TV show called The Middleman that was on in 2008, right? And one of the things that 
I always thought as a showrunner you need to do is to like make sure that you establish a clean direction for everything. You have to make sure that everybody knows the word cloud of the show. Like what is the conceptual foundation of the show? It's a pretty much the only job a showrunner has that makes the showrunner special. So the showrunner is the only one who can define what the show is for everybody. So, I mean, I got a real crash course in how to do that practically because, for example, one of the things that I said to the, to the creatives on, on the show, to all of the artists who were working on props and costumes and everything, I said, this is a chubby show. And they're like, well, what does that mean? And I'm like, well, I want everything to be sort of rounded. I, want, I don't want any hard angles on the show. I want everything to be kind of, to look slightly overinflated, you know? So I remember being at a prop meeting, right? And like the, the subject of, there was a, the prop guy and then there was a, an assistant prop guy who just started that week. And, and, and we were talking about a scene with a hammer, right? And the assistant prop guy goes, oh, I have a hammer right here. Can is something like this okay? And I remember the, 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 the main prop guy goes, no, 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 no. We need a chubby hammer, just yeah. back off. <laughs> And that's sort of how I, like, I realized, oh my God, like, that's what the job is. You know, like when, you, when you're a writer on a staff on a show and you go to the prop meeting, you don't realize you actually need to tell these people if it's not written in the script, what do these props look like and how do the props tell the story and how can they help you tell the story? So it takes a great deal of, you need, you need to be the person, as a writer, you know the script and the story better than anybody else, but then you, you also have to take that knowledge beyond into all the stuff you didn't put on the page. What's that supposed to look like, you know? So, so you knew that, like going, like when you were a showrunner, you knew to come in and you had that vision of like this is a chubby show. Oh yeah. But do you remember when you learned that that was something you had to know to be in that role, like to be the showrunner? You had to kind of understand when you were going to talk to the prop guy, you better have an idea of what to tell him. Well, that, that's the thing is when you're not the showrunner, right? Like the show, for me, the showrunner has one job, and it's really just one job because everybody else can do all the other jobs the showrunner does. In fact, the showrunner is usually surrounded by people who can do all the jobs better than they can. The showrunner is basically. And I don't believe that there's geniuses in the entertainment industry. I'm sorry to any geniuses that might be here. Um, I think there's situational genius. You're the showrunner. You've been anointed the situational genius. You're the situational. It's, that's your situation. You're the genius, right? What makes you a genius is you know the show better than anybody. The show's in your head. And your job is to define that for yourself and then basically be like the energizer bunny. And any room you go into, you're just pounding the symbols of this is this kind of show. Maybe you're saying it's in costumes. So when you're not the showrunner, right? Part of your job is to get into the head of your showrunner and know what they're going to like to see on the screen. You know, when you've got a showrunner like, um, you know, you worked on Gilmore Girls, you know, we've got a showrunner like Amy, Amy Sherman Palladino, it's not as hard necessarily to know kind of like what that person's worldview is just because the show is so quirky and so defined. But if you're working on a show that's a little bit less stylized, you know, like it's, it's a real, and, and especially if you're working for a taciturn, middle-aged white man who doesn't like his family very much um, and just wants to stay in the office as long as possible so that they don't have to go home and talk to their wife, <laughs> they tend to not be as descriptive about what they really want because if they tell you quickly what they want and concisely, then they have to go home and see their wife. <laughs> so it's a real job. Thank you for waking, waking everybody up. It's a good, <laughs> good, good, good way to do it. It's my Harrison Ford impersonation. Uh, honestly... Right on. Um, well, you, you kind of, we touched on this a little bit, but there was something I wanted to talk about in terms of going to set, because um, I guess from my perspective, just you know, learning the industry and, and looking at it from the outside as a critic and a journalist, one of the things I hear over and over is how kind of unique and privileged it is for shows like Veep and Succession to bring their writers to set and have them working on set and you know, to have them there to, to you know, help with lines and, and you know, do what they need to do to improve that show. Um, but like, I mean, Javi, you mentioned that you went to post-production before oh, yeah. you went to set. That was the, like you were in post before you ended up going to a set. Is that normal? And when did you go? Well, the show shot in Orlando, so we weren't okay. all flying out at all the time. But look, it's interesting how you say that, oh, we have the privilege of having the writers on the set. It's not a privilege. The, the writers need to be on the set because they're the only people who know the story. <laughs> you know? Nobody knows the story as well as the writers. And it's like, it's amazing how literally in less than 10 years, we've gone from a culture where that was the standard. You went to a job on a show to be in producing school so you could learn how to show run and you had to be in every aspect to, well, it's a real privilege to have the writers on the set because, you know, they, they know a thing or two. Like, I don't, I don't understand that. Like, and it's weird because streaming and the way that streaming does TV has changed that so much. Um, and I think we're sort of losing an entire generation of writers who are not going to have the necessary experience to push their creative vision to where it has to be in order for TV to be great. Yeah, and I mean... I have not actually worked on a, well, I worked on a limited series, which has done like a movie where all the scripts are written. I did this great show called Gaslit as a, um, I was in the Zoom room for that during COVID. But 
TV, the way we always did it, was all moving parts. So even the idea of like the writer on the set, I mean, Sony was amazing about sending us all to set on Dawson's Creek, which was filmed in North Carolina. And honestly, set is great, but prep is almost even better. I mean, that's like one of my favorite stories from, you know, young idiot me is like, I'm at the, I guess we were having like a production meeting and, you know, the notes had come in from the network and I was already in my first year on Dawson's kind of doing my own notes, like which not all showrunners let the writers do the notes, which is, you know, the, the notes come in from the network, you've got to change stuff, you've got to make it work. So the first time I'm doing this, I get to the production meeting the next day and the pages have been issued and the first AD just looks at me and like kind of screams at me like, you created a car overnight! And like, you know, the thing was shooting that day. Like you can't ask the transpo department and like to picture cars to find a car. <laughs> like, I mean, it's, an, you know, whatever. It's like you're making everybody else's jobs harder if you're not all working together and getting on the same page. So that was an example of like, it's not just whatever you imagine is the best fix for this network note, it's also the one that like, we're shooting this tomorrow, is, was usually how we were operating, which, I mean, not all 23 episode shows were like that. We did have a high degree of chaos, which is the other, besides actual real amazing mentors, chaos is the ultimate mentor, I mean, for me. Because <laughs> you get to do everything. Does, that does sound like what I've consistently heard about TV. Um, well, can you guys, I guess, give a couple of examples? Like, again, Javi, the way you phrased it was so good in terms of, of you know, why it's, it's essential for writers to be on set and why that should be an expectation. But can you talk a little bit about just what you do while you're there? Like, what that, what that part of the job becomes? Because, again, like, it's not what people may think about when they're thinking of writers just sitting, you know, behind a computer with a pen or what, what have you. Like, what are you doing while you're out there? Well, it, you know, when you're, when you're not the showrunner but you're a writer on set, and that's most of what I've done. I've, I've worked as number two or as a producer on many more shows than I've showrun. You're really, you're really there to represent the flag, okay? The showrunner is the situational genius. They are the, 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 that, that person is the person who knows the show better than anybody, and you're the person closest to that person because you're in the writer's room with them because you've written the script. They've probably taken a pass at the script. Some of the things you're going to have to defend are, are theirs, you know? The actor doesn't like a line, you know? Well, that's, that's a conversation that you need to have. Look, sometimes sitting on a set as a writer, like, um, you know, like, like the, for example, the set of Lost was, was really difficult for me because it was in a tropical country. Um, and it was very warm, and you're literally just sitting there in this uncomfortable direct. I don't know why they don't make better chairs, by the way. The chairs are hor... <laughs> you know that classic director's chair? Holy crap. Like, it's just, it's literally, like, like it, I think a spinal surgeon designed it so they could get more business, you know? <laughs> um, so... A lot of the time on that set, you know, like once the sh once we had gone through prep on the show, you know, so you you go you go to the production. You're in every meeting. You're in every prep meeting, every prop meeting, every costume meeting, everything to make sure that everything looks like what the showrunner would say, you know. Um, and then you're on set, and sometimes the set feels really tedious because you're sitting behind the monitors watching every take. And on Lost, for example, just sitting there on a beach, you know, with two inches of sunscreen uh, slathered on my skin, the beach is right there. I can't go in it. You know, so I'm just sitting there, you know, doing this, and it's I'm in paradise, but I'm, you know, sitting on a bad chair watching a a, a, a monitor. But then it happens. Then a prop fails. Then an actor doesn't like a line. You know, then you know, like like um, then you have to have that conversation. You know, or then the weather changes, and tomorrow's yes. location has to be completely changed up. Yes. Or you have to have that conversation of, are we willing to put our crew through like an exterior night in the rain, or can we reimagine this scene and make it something great that like we could do on either a set or like a location that we own, and we could m change it that quickly because it's the end of the day, we're wrapping up, but like we have some key players there who can address that situation. Yeah, and and look, ultimately, I think it's it's like um, you're you're there to troubleshoot. You're there to represent the showrunner. You're there to make the call to the showrunner if a problem arrives that is that is uh, beyond your pay scale, you know. But you're also there so that you know. Look, when when the director is the, the the weird tension on the set is that it's the director's set. As a writer, even as the showrunner, to some degree, you're still a guest on their set. You know, uh, you're you're the admiral, but you're there's a captain on the ship, right? So a lot of it is also the diplomacy of it. You know, it's also being knowing when to talk to the director if the director's not getting quite the shot or the coverage you want, being able to, you know, lean in and ask them the question and talk to the script supervisor about whether you have enough coverage and all of that. So you're also there. You're also there to make sure that when it goes to editing, 
right? That there is that there's enough to cut together, you know, and a good director will give you that, but you might want different things. So there's also that diplomacy of here's a captain, I'm a commander, but I'm representing the admiral. I got to talk to this guy, you know. That's that's a big part of it too. Yeah, because there are instances where the showrunner isn't even on set. There's instances where the showrunner is, you know, back in the room or, or off doing another thing, and the writers are there who kind of, like you said, have to be that representative. Yeah, I, I honestly think I told this story the last time I came to this wonderful festival, but um, uh, because of the panel was more focused on this. But I, so I was the writer of the, one of the four credited writers on the Dawson's Creek episode, which is the first ever gay kiss that was on TV that was romantic and not comic. And um, so the the. Day they, I was then, it was our season finale, I was the writer who traveled to Wilmington to be there during production of that episode. So I was on set that day and it was, I was gonna say it was like the year 2000, I think. And honestly, I had my showrunner at that point was Greg Berlanti and he was like, Gina, this has to be the best kiss ever. I, it's gotta be hot, I wanna see, like it's, I gotta feel it. <laughs> and then like at the same time, I have like other producers on the phone saying, well, the network is concerned and can you shoot this? <laughs> from across the street. So like that was a time when I wasn't the showrunner. Honestly, it was my first year on a one hour drama. But yeah, I mean, it all worked out. But like, yeah, you're kind of there to like make sure that, you know, you can advocate for, for the people who, you know, you work for. All right, so you mentioned this already about the post-production, but I did want to dig into that a little sure. bit too. Um, so the first experience that you had, Javi, was when was when you just were told to go there. Yep, like, go to a cut. Like go do a okay. cut, and then I mean, what was it like sitting in that room? What do you learn as you're in there? Like, the editor was awesome. Contribute? We had great editors on that show, and it was also like I mean, look, one of the, the privileges of working on on that show specifically is that it was the first show that was cut on the Lightworks nonlinear editing system. Um, so it was really kind of amazing because literally Sequest, while dramatically perhaps not the most great example of narrative integrity. Um, it, was, it was on the cutting edge of technology. So, <laughs> um, so, we, uh, so we, you know, like, I mean, we were cutting nonlinear and that was amazing. And we were also doing the CGI visual effects. So like a lot of the post-production process was, you know, the battle is spelled out in the script, but you still have to go talk to the storyboard guy who was working with Amblin Imaging, which was a CGI company that was built specifically for Sequest you know, and start working on all of that stuff. So, and they were on the universe a lot. So we, our job was expanded by just by dint of, ha by, by the way, another reason why I don't like shooting in other, in other states or other countries is that, you know, if you have everything in the same place, it makes the showrunner's job and, and the producer's job a lot easier because you can go to costumes, you can go to VFX, whatever. But look, the, the, uh, the editor said, here's the cut. You see, I had seen the cut on, on tape already. It was a VHS uh, tape back then. Um, so I knew what the, what the show looked like and I knew kind of what I wanted it you know, whatever, and the job is, you know, you sit there, ideally as the writer, you've seen everything that's been shot, all the dailies have been sent to you. You know what's there and you basically talk to, with the editor about, can we make this tighter, can we do this, how are we telling the story here? It ultimately, look, ultimately there's a lot of jobs like that where you think, oh, this is gonna be very technical and very that and all that, but it literally just boils down to one thing, what's the story you're telling? And what's the most um, economical, in TV, economy is everything, even if you're doing a languid drama, you know, you, you still have to have a real sort of economy of storytelling in it. So you, you could know nothing about nonlinear editing. If you know what the story is you're telling, which is what the writers do, you have a good insight to have when you go into an editing room because you can tell the editor, look, I, th I feel like we need to be on this character more because that's whose story it is, you know? So even just that kind of insight is incredibly important. And yeah, we took, you know, we took five minutes out of the episode and you know, the, 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 the editor was great and he talked me through it and I told him kind of what I wish we could do and he told me whether we could or not and we talked about the coverage we had and we went from there, you know. The other, the other great thing about that particular thing is, you know, Gina was talking about how, the, you know, maybe the showrunner isn't on set. The showrunner should be on set and in post and anywhere else as little as possible. The showrunner, and it's interesting because a lot of showrunners go to editing to hide from their writers. They go to True. set to hide from the writers, you know, and then... And then, you know, like the, the show gets shot and they say things like, well, you know, I got to go into editing to find the episode, <laughs> to which I always wanted to say I never did because I like having jobs. Well, you know, maybe you should have tried to find it in the writer's room because that's where you lost it. Um, so a lot of the job of the writer producer is to try to keep the showrunner's butt in the writer's room where they can actually put that vision that they have to play at the most seminal level of the show. Okay, so that's, you know, so that, and that's why post is important. You know, that's why, that's why you need to know what story you're telling. That's why you need to know how to deal with those aspects of post so that your showrunner can stay where the story's at. 
Uh, Gina, do you have anything to add in terms of like just kind of what what writers can like? I, I I feel like this is something that's come up because of the strike and because we're talking about you know what responsibilities they're allowed and not like writers in the guild are allowed or not allowed to do. And we're seeing people who are you know disagreeing over whether or not like hey I I it's in post like I can go help with post and other people are like oh no that's that's off limits. Can we like is there a way to kind of help like I mean you broke that down great Javi but like is there more we can say to kind of illustrate why it's a writer's job to be there and why it is you know writing still even though you're talking about cutting and editing an episode I mean yeah the the whole I mean honestly the the biggest back in I mean I've always worked on shows that are quite inexpensive <laughs> so the biggest sin you could commit was to shoot a scene and make people you know stand out in Dawson's lawn all night long and not put it in the show so that like, that's what the room was for that we were supposed to know what the scenes were that we needed to tell the story and that's just a waste of money but it's also just a waste of everybody's time it's really hard to make anything so um so yeah like I, I had a very satisfying moment once where like I also have been on staff more than I've actually been a showrunner but you know the thing that you say in the room and like let's just say they don't listen to you. <laughs> but you're like, I don't think that's going to work. Like, I think these two scenes, you don't need the, you know, A is going to connect to C and you don't need B. And like, once you've said it a couple times, you just let it go because that's what it means to be in the room. Um, but then to be in the editing room and or to watch the final cut that the showrunner has done and realize, oh, I was right. <laughs> it's like so satisfying. But that's that's part of the learning to me. That was part of the learning of how to tell the story. And yeah, I mean, I only know the system where we as writers are making the thing at every single step of the process. And I, like being on set, but also again, prep, like we said, is just all of these meetings where you're making sure that everybody is on the same page. And like, I was so proud of how my show Dare Me turned out and, you know, really the the vibe of just everybody communicating and being in sync at every stage of the process, I think is what made it so great. I think that's what a good showrunner does. I mean, it's like, you you know, you can, you can it, it's really about channeling all of the energies into the same direction, you know? And I think that a lot of showrunners, look, writers um, temperamentally as a stereotype are not the most communicative outwardly people. Um, and are not the best sort of like most gregarious kind of, but a great deal of, of the job is diplomacy, you know, and it's, it, but you have a lever in your diplomacy, which is that, again, you're the only person who knows the show. And that's a huge responsibility because exactly what you said, you have to make sure the machine keeps moving in the right direction. And a lot of that is not trying to do anybody else's job for them, you know, which is again, why you should have a staff of writers that you can send out into the land with your evangel so they can tell everybody what the show is, you know? Um, because because the, the, the tendency as a showrunner is to want to do everything. It's to want to be in the editing room all the time, you know, uh, pretending that you're actually doing work, you know? Um, Nonlinear editing has created an entire brand of producer who, whenever a non-writing person says, I'm great in post, run for the hills, okay? <laughs> that, that just means they know how to sit on a leather couch and make an editor crazy. Because nonlinear, non-destructive editing means you have levels of undo you can literally look at a scene and just frame fuck the scene to like the cows come home you know you just literally say oh what if we cut the tail what if we do this what if we do this? hey can we do a little chroma key effect here and you're like dude it's it's a cut you're fine um so it, but it so it really is about being out being with the people being everywhere you can be at any given time and making sure the energies are all flowing in the right direction and the machine is greased properly you know well, you, you talked a little bit at the start of this even about how like all of these skills are essential to what you guys do as writers, and they seem to be skills that you guys learned by doing. Like you were in the job, like you had the job. Uh, people either told you like, "Hey, you've got to do this," or you know, it just kind of came up all, along with the rest of your responsibilities. Um, but you mentioned that this isn't something that's necessarily happening as much anymore. This we're losing this. Can you talk a little bit about in the last ten or fifteen years what kind of cut that ladder short? Like what kind of eliminated that process for a lot of young writers who are coming up and wanting to, you know, do everything you're doing? Streaming came in and disrupted everything, right? And one of the ways they disrupted it is that the way writers' rooms work in streaming shows is that you spend six months in a room creating the scripts and then everybody gets told to F off. And the only person left over is the showrunner and maybe whoever the least expensive writer was on the staff, right? And then, and then production begins. And then you have to figure out what you can actually do. Okay, so all of the writers who were there writing the scripts who could like give many, many ideas about how you can change things, what you can do to address production, they're all gone. I had a job, it was at the, uh, during the lockdown. Um, it was on a show, uh, it was on a streaming show and um, they wrote their uh, 10, yeah, I think 10 episode season 
Um, and then the writers were told to F off, and they did. And then they gave notes. <laughs> and one of the notes was, can you please remove the subplot that takes up between a fourth and a third of the season? <laughs> so the showrunner, all the writers had gone. They'd all gone, move on to other jobs because a really good showrunner who trained her people well. So they called me in, and they're like, can you just spend 10 weeks with the showrunner like fixing this? And I said, yeah, that sounds phenomenal. So it was just me and the showrunner literally removing you know, between a fourth and a third of the season and then trying to make everything else work while keeping the work of these really cool writers who did wonderful stuff. You know, So the moment that you cut the writing from the production, right? what you're doing is you're basically telling the writers, your job is just to be in this room. You don't have to talk to anybody else or do anything else and all that. That's a huge bunch of education that's going. Okay, And the other thing you're doing is you're telling the showrunner when the show goes into production, which by the way is the only time you know whether the show's actually gonna work or not. Uh, you know, like Dark Crystal, right, was a very, very expensive puppet show. Okay, very expensive. I don't think I'm allowed to say the cipher, but it's a lot. Okay, and it's, a, it's, it's, it's literally doing a high fantasy with the narrative density of Game of Thrones entirely with puppets, okay? And we wrote it in a vacuum. Now, we would go to the creature shop every week and, and, and look at the puppets as they were being built and see what the puppets could do, and you know, Lisa Henson would come in and say, well, puppets aren't really good at picking things up because of the hand stuff in us. So we knew some of those things. Yeah, then we, then, then, then we go to England and we have 10 scripts that our production has to figure out how to make with puppets. And you know, a type, of, a type of show that's never been done before. And there was one writer on set when his writing partner was back in LA and they had to do all of this reworking on it and it's exhausting, difficult work that should not fall on one person and no one person should have to come up with all of those solutions. Obviously they're working with the crew and the director and everything, but a staff of writers is how you solve those production problems, you know? Yeah, I'll just second that phrase. He just said, writing in a vacuum. Like, that's, that's the thing that, honestly, I haven't, you know, like I said, I worked on that one limited series where the amazing creator and, you know, his co-exec producer, like, they stayed with the show after the point the scripts were written, and they made it come to life. It was eight episodes of television. But my whole career, I mean, I also, in the, my, the beginning, after I got off Dawson's, and also before, I worked on shows that got canceled. Like those jobs, we would make eight to 12 episodes of television. And, um, but like, it was the beginning of something. So I, I think that, I swear, I look back and I think that Greg Daniels actually said that to me when I was his assistant, which is that the first six episodes are where we find it. Like, I think Seinfeld was always the classic example back in the day. And, and that like the work that people are doing as a group to find the show, it, yes, there's this person who wrote the pilot. And, you know, uh, I totally agree with everything you said about like the, the geniuses of, um, um, the world because it is things just come together like magic and uh, that that time that you spend finding the show I mean honestly actually I'm so thrilled and delighted that I got to make a pilot because that had gone away with streaming the idea of making a pilot and I was someone who staffed and staffed and worked on so many shows and had these amazing experience but I had never really made my own pilot until 2018 when I got to make the Dare Me pilot with USA Network and you know we hired an amazing director Steph Green and we we found what the what the pilot was and that then when we got our writing staff we could say this is what we're making like we're this far into the journey that we think this is what we're doing and everybody else get on board so it, it was a it was such a great it was I thought it was just a great system and and writing in a vacuum I haven't done and it scares me uh, well I think I'm gonna open this up to the audience q a in just a second but um, I think there may be a simple answer to this next question but what can we do what can be done to kind of fix this and push things back in the right direction like how can we start making sure that young writers are getting that opportunity that you guys had as well as you know being protected and working in a safe environment like what is kind of the step-by-step -step or, or some ideas for this this kind of solution the, the, I'm working on the Witcher right now um, and uh, the showrunner on that show Lauren history who is just phenomenal showrunner I mean she's one of the best I've worked with, actually made a deal with Netflix that part of the season would be that the writers, if they had not moved on to other jobs, would go on set. Um, and uh, yeah. And I mean, I, I applaud her for that vision, you know, because she's, she's somebody who came out of the John Wells world. Her first job was in the West Wing and then she was in Shondaland, so she's come, coming out of the network universe and she, she knows that value, you know? And look, I think if, if we're not gonna, we're gonna go back to some ad-supported model of TV at some point. People keep saying, what's the future of television? I'm like, the future of television is Netflix is gonna figure out that they have to make television at some point. <laughs> um, 
but oh, we, they're never going to have ads. They're never going no, to have no, ads. no, no, no. You know, and they're never going to release a show like on a certain date and time. They're never going to do that. <laughs> they should have a, an app that does that. You know, every on a certain date and time, the shows drop so that people have like anticipate. Never mind. Anyway, um, <laughs> the simple answer to your question is: if we don't go back to a model where we are doing it. Uh, because that is the structure of it, then we have to bake it into the contractual structure of it. That's it. And they have to p pony up to have the writers on set and to keep us in the show as employees of the show for the duration of the writing and the production of the show. And that's what we're striking for. Yeah. 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 yeah, what what he said. Uh, all right, well, last thing for me was just, uh, you know, it's, it can be very difficult for a young writer entering this new world, you know. I mean, when you start a new job in any situation, at least I always feel like I am a fraud and I don't know why I'm here and I don't have any, like, I just do what they tell me to do. But what can they do to kind of advocate for themselves? Like, what, what advice would you have for young writers who are kind of entering this position now, um, again, once uh, the strike is over and, and things are improving? Um, what would you kind of tell them to do to look out for themselves and put themselves on the right track? Um, I'm just going to go back to when I was a young writer and I was a staff writer and my amazing friend Chris Turner um, said to me, write the thing that only you can write. And uh, I come back to that consistently throughout my, my whole career. And, you know, I'm in such a fortunate position now where I can work on other people's shows. And, and uh, but even if I have a chance to take a job on a show like that, I think to myself, do I have a connection to this? Like, is there something I really feel that I can, you know, give so much of my life and my mental energy to? And anything you feel that connection to, you're going to write it better because you're going to spend more time working on it. You're going to be, you know, just filled up by it. What she said. <laughs> uh, all right, well, let's hear from our audience. Uh, yeah, right here in the front. Well, every show now that we're post streaming, every show is completely different. So in, in the old days of network TV, um, especially if you were a person, you know, like me who was just going up for jobs every year, you were sent pilot scripts and you would go out and you would meet with the showrunner um, who had either written that pilot or who was running that show. And uh, I mean, hilariously, like, yeah, the, they were actual when I started, actual scripts. <laughs> and uh, yeah, you would just read them and try to, you know, prepare for your meeting. Sometimes they would actually show you the pilot episode and, uh, and then you'd have a meeting. And if you got the job, um, you know, when I got the job on Dawson's Creek, it was season three. And uh, thankfully, you know, we're not just TV writers, we're TV fans. I knew someone, even though I had not seen any of Dawson's Creek, <laughs> I knew someone who had the whole thing on VHS. So I showed up my first day having watched all 35 episodes, having broken them down beat by beat, scene by scene, and thinking this is what this show is. But you can't do that with a new show. Like you just show up having read the pilot, you know, thought about the world, and it's very much a job where you're you're making it happen right then and there. Uh, okay, yeah, let's go to the back corner there. Hi, I loved Abby, what you said about um, showrunners should prioritize the writers' room in the day to day and the fog of war. Have you both had experiences where your prior your obligation as a lead decision maker? as a leader in the writer's room collided, and when did you have to prioritize one or the other, and what you learned from that? Or have you worked with a showrunner who either did that well or poorly, and what you learned from that? Look, I think, I think um, it happens constantly. And the way that you protect against it is to make sure that your writers, are, your writer producers, are really well informed. You give them all the information that they need so that they can you know, make those calls for you. And so that if they can't make the call or if they feel daunted by the call, that they just pick up the phone and call you, you know, while you are doing any number. Look, the, the job of running a show is you're literally the CEO of a corporation that has a $100 million budget and like 300 employees, okay? So you're always gonna be pushed in every direction, you know? There, there's a, 
the Berlin, uh, there's a conductor in the Berlin Symphony named Herbert von Karajan, and he was known as being imperious and very egotistical, right? And the joke they used to tell about him was, he, he goes into a cab and the cab driver says, where to? And he goes, it doesn't matter, I'm needed everywhere. <laughs> um, <laughs> but that's kind of what it's like to be a showrunner, you know? So, you know, you, you basically, you, you know, you prioritize by making sure that every employee that you have knows exactly what their job is and what they're doing. It is just about distributing information and writers tend to be so precious with their ideas, with the contents of their mind. It, it almost feels anathema to be management if you're a writer, you know? And I think that that's the learned skill and look, when you get pushed in a different direction, you know what you do? You leave the writer's room to your trusted subordinate, your co-executive producer, or your co-showrunner or whatever, who you spent a lot of time with and whom you've spent a lot of time communicating the vision of the show to, and you let that person do that job because that's their job too, you know? I mean, it doesn't, you know, it's funny, you know, you talk about the CEOs of companies and all that, but, you know, they have entire hierarchies of people underneath them who carry out their bidding. It's no different in television. It's just you have 10 writers, you know? Do you have anything you wanted to add to that one? No. <laughs> uh, yeah, right here. So you talked about being on set, being your production school, but you also just mentioned you're like a CEO. So what about the management aspect of being a showrunner? And how do you learn managerial skills as somebody who didn't do that before? That's uh, that's interesting because I realized at a certain point. So I was a person who had been on staff of so many shows, um, had been a number two in the room for years and years and years. Finally became a show martyr, and I was like, oh, the one part of the job that I actually have not done is just this interacting with the executives, um, which we sort of sometimes call managing up, I guess. So, um, but I realized when I look back, I'm like, okay, being the number two in the room, you know, a lot of what I was doing was mentoring the people in the room and like managing their like expectations of what was going to happen this week. And uh, so I think that, um, and honestly, you know, there's a part of me that's just like, what can't be solved by just being kind and listening to people? I mean, you know. I mean, what she said, you'd, you'd be, you know, I had an experience where um, the, the lead actor on my show was complaining about her boots. And, uh, you know, I went to the costume designer and I said, the lead's complaining about her boots again. You know, we need to do something. And then she berated me for about 20 minutes about how she didn't have enough money or time or people to get to, to send a, a dedicated team on a shopping expedition to get the boots. And I listened to her and I and then after after that, I said, yeah, but we still have to get new boots. You know, but the difference between me saying, get the fucking boots, what are you talking about, do your job, was I sat there and I listened to this person who was very upset with me uh, and very upset about certain structures, and I listened, and I said, look, I understand all of that. This is the problem on the table right now, but she had had the opportunity to vent to me to have those 20 minutes of my time, which as the resident genius, that time's very valuable, right? My time's extraordinarily valuable when I'm the genius. When I'm not the genius, my time's shit. Um, <laughs> When I'm a co-EP, my time is yours. You can do whatever you want with me. But um, no, but, but just being able to do that. And it's like, look, sometimes that's your job. Sometimes your job is you have to be someone's hate puppet. And, and you know, look, if, it's, just, it's, just, it's just what you do. You just, you, you, but it's, what Gina just said is, is crucial. It's like, maybe you don't know how to be a manager, but if, you know, but if you're a decent person, and you do the thing you think is right, i.e. listen to the person, i.e. give them a clear directive, i.e. whatever, it's not that hard. You know, specifically because you have authority. And once authority is bestowed on you, you're de facto the person who's going to make the decision anyway. Uh, yeah, let's go to the back right there. Hi, thank you both for your time. Um, this question uh, is for what uh, Jim had said earlier, and uh, Javier, you have also had this experience, I would love to hear from him as well. Um, Jim, you had mentioned on Dawson's Street, you know, say a writer being there on set is to represent the showrunner. And you have mentioned that um, Greg was for the kiss and the network had concerns. So I was just curious how you navigated that or um, like any tips or suggestions on how to work with that situation. Um, 
Yeah, in that particular situation, you just you do have to just talk to everyone involved there because honestly, it's the director's set, and um, and the actors have a relationship with the director in that moment. Um, but the you know everybody just needed to get on board and come together and make sure you know that we were clear on it. And then through the magic of television, you just get many sizes, right? <laughs> and like if you if you have those sizes, then you can make. I mean, it's a little disingenuous to say you make the decision later, but that is how we make TV. Then, like, I could come back, you know, from the set and say, like, you know, we have, we do have the version where it's shot from across the street very wide, and we do have the closer versions, and then everybody can feel a part of, of that decision. So it is, looking back, I do realize how much of it is communication, and that's, I mean, it's the joke for a lot of us. It's like writing when you're just a solitary writer is often about the joy of control. And I, mean, I eventually wrote a book because I wanted to have that pleasure of just, these are my sentences. Um, and TV writing is not that. That is just not what it is. It helps if you're like a gregarious, benign narcissist with a insatiable need for attention born of childhood trauma. <laughs> And then you just like to telling people stuff all the time. I don't know if that's advice, but I mean, I guess that is useful to know. Uh, yeah, sure. Why not the front? Uh, so because uh, we're, we're at where we're at as far as, you know, writers not being able to go to set and not being able to go to kind of show running school, um, what would you suggest to writers who are, you know, going out and pitching their stuff and wanting to become showrunners? Uh, what could we be doing in the meantime to kind of get those skills in the meantime? Um, about seven years ago, longer than that, I think, actually more like eight, I was getting drunk with Jose Molina before our Dungeons and Dragons game. And, uh, and we made a list of all of the sociopathic abusers we'd worked for. And then we made a list of the good ones. And one list was significantly longer than the other. I won't say which. Um, <laughs> So we decided that once somebody's a showrunner, they've basically, the world has told them they're the genius and a lot of people don't want to let go of that. And they're rich, so what are you going to do? So we decided to get them while they're young. You know? So we started doing this podcast called Children of Tendu. And the podcast is entirely everything Jose and I know about being in television. It is literally like, I mean, I think we've done about 40 episodes of it. It's not like, a, you know, we interview people sometimes, but it's, not, it's, it's literally just us picking a topic from I just landed in LA, how do I get my first job, all the way up to I just started running a show. Um, it's how we do it, it's not how perhaps people should do it, I don't know. I, I wouldn't want people to make my mistakes, but that's part of it. So I think part of it is a lot of, and, and that's not just said to tell you, well I'm a great person who's doing this, I'm saying one of the things that's happening right now in the showrunning culture is a lot of showrunners have figured out that this is happening and they're on Twitter, they're giving out advice on Twitter. I'm, I have this webpage. If you're pitching, you can literally go to my webpage and download every pitch and Bible I've ever written, you know, and samples of my scripts and stuff like that. Showrunners who are beginning to realize that the industry is kind of eating its young right now are being very, very uh, forthright about putting their experience out there, mostly on social media. And I think that's a big part of it, you know? And I think that also, because being a television writer, sometime in the aughts became something glamorous that people wanted to do, and fans began sort of, I mean, it's weird, right? It's true. Yeah. In the 90s, we were not cool. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, you know, there's a lot of information out there, and I think you need to seek out that information, and I think that, but it is out there because a lot of us have seen this need and are trying to fill it. Yeah, and for the record, you were cool. People just hadn't realized it yet, so we're catching up. Thank you. Um, I think we got time for a couple more. Is anybody right here in the front? Yeah. I hear from my development friends, they always talk about showrunning like a war zone. They're just like, oh, when we promoted this writer to showrunner, they could handle it. And I'm just like, how much of that is true given, because I'm talking to development execs. Look, everybody has a vested interest in making their job look like the hardest job in the world so that they look really good when they do it well, okay? Um, you know, and, and there's a whole cottage industry of writers talking about how difficult it is to write. You know, like, oh, you just sit in front of the blank page and then you drill a hole in your head and you bleed into the page. That's what writing is. You know, look, when the, when the time comes, we just bang it the fuck out because we're writers, we're professionals, okay? The entire, in terms of like sort of toxic upper management, dysfunctional showrunning, all this stuff, it's, 
it's literally just about being a professional, okay? You're a professional doing a professional job. You're not some tortured, sensitive artist who's gonna take offense at everything. There are things that need to get done. You have a schedule, you know? And look, most of the showrunners that I know who are in over their heads and, you know, doing the war, it's a war, oh my God, they're, they're just not particularly great managers of their own time. And I shouldn't catch any, cash, ca, you know, ca, cast any aspersions. I have no executive function whatsoever. You know, I mean, I, I can barely order lunch, you know? But um, when you are on the job, you are a professional. And if you keep your sight on the idea that this is, you know, do surgeons say like, oh, surgery was like a war zone today. It was so much chaos. No, they don't because they know what they're doing and so's our job. And, and the more people sort of treat our job like it's some sort of artistic, you know, it is artistic, but it's not some woo-woo thing where we're sort of resting narrative from the living rock of the holy mountain. We're fucking pros making a show, man. You know, like the moment you demystify it for yourself that way, the easier it gets. I, one thing, no, that's... One thing I will add, just because I do think there is a real issue where people are not set up for success exactly. They've written a great pilot and everybody loves it. Um, and I have watched many people who, you know, were not showrunners become showrunners, like just instantly. But um, I remember my first job, I was the showrunner's assistant. And like, I honestly, that job I think nowadays is honestly, we were on all the phone calls back then, which is a big difference. I finally noticed I got to have an assistant finally. And I was like, oh. So I do think that like I very early in my career, I noticed that having been a showrunner's assistant versus someone who just started in the room, that person only knew about the writing side of it. And I mean, the, even the idea that you need a schedule. I mean, I think there are people coming into it who like, you know, their, their voice and they've written this amazing creative work and, and everybody's process is different of how they want to create a show. But even the fact that you need a schedule, some people I think are coming in not realizing. And, and I was that incredibly anxious <laughs> person as a, you know, on Dawson's, I was making schedules before anybody even told me that was a thing just because I wanted that in my own life. And and then um, I realized, wow, this is an amazing thing. Let's just have a writer's calendar. But I think there are people coming in who don't even understand that, that a huge part of what we're doing when we're making a show is we are guaranteeing the delivery of these scripts. And if you are the kind of writer who pushes it to the last minute, um, I also have a whole other thing I'm gonna do someday, which is just writing is just outlining. And like, if you don't have the outlines and you're doing a work on this giant scale, then you're not gonna be able to, you know, get to the part where your, you know, amazing dialogue can be showcased to everyone. So I think there are some basic things that you really need to know about how a show is made. Um, and everything else you just pick up along the way. And obviously, if in the best situations, you get paired up with someone who has done it before. And you can make good, good, teams can come up that way. Uh, all right, one more right here in the back, yeah. Um, I was just going to say thank you all so much for talking about um, the aspect of it being a team effort. I like one of my friends, Becca, she was talking about coming here for the film festival and how like the screenwriter and the television writer, the, uh, the difference is the <laughs> idea of it being like, a cohesive piece. Um, and talking about like working as an assistant and all of the other things that you have to do, because a part of it is very proactive. Like, being a PA on a show was super helpful, just because I got to learn the aspects of it. So thank you for talking about that, and for it not just seeming like something that is like, oh, that's not important, but it is. And, and it is a team effort, like television, and thank you so much for really going in on that, because it's, it's just, I don't thank know you. about it. Appreciate it. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. All right, well, that's a very positive note to end on. Thank you for that, yeah. and thank you all for being here. Thank you for coming. Thank you for sharing your stories. And, uh, yeah, guys, enjoy the rest of the fest. <laughs>